All right, so we all ready to learn about tarpon fishing tonight? So, before we start on tarpon, how many people here bottom fish? How many people saw the post I put on Facebook the other night about making sure that you're, you're zoomed to the bottom when you're bottom fishing? Oh, that many. Zero. I did. So, tarpon fishing is short and sweet. Something that'll help, that'll hopefully help some of y'all. I'm gonna roll this up here. If you're not bottom locking your screen when you're bot when you split this split your screen, so you have, you know, here's zero, here's two ten, here's one eighty five to two ten. Most people, this is so important when you're especially grouper fishing. I know. You know, we got snappers right now too, but everybody wants to go catch groupers. If you didn't have this, you may drive right past this bottom right here and never stop and grouper fish. When we're grouper fishing, great. That's snapper. We're all going to stop and fish on that. It's pretty obvious. But when we're, when we're grouper fishing, this is what you're going to see on the bottom. We, everybody knows that the red is the hard bottom, but this little green and yellow fuzz, well, that tells us that it's live bottom. And when we're looking at this right here, this is what it actually looks like zoomed in. But all this little fuzzy stuff, this is live bottom. And groupers, they don't get, you're not going to see them necessarily up in the water because they're living under coral heads and they're down in the little caves. And this bottom, once you drop, it may take 5 or 10 or 15 minutes before you get the first bite. But once you get the first bite, then you'll get a second and a third, and that bottom will just come alive. Um, but this is what you're, you know, so important to have this bottom zoomed in. Um, and I'll show you, I got one more really good photo, picture that I took. These are, these are ones that I took the other day. This there again, this was that same bottom when it came alive. So when we pulled up, we were there, and then we got that. That's after you catch two fish. It's just alive. You know, same here. This doesn't look like much until I zoom that in. You probably wouldn't stop and fish if you saw that, would you? But you would sure stop and fish if you saw that. So very important to have. I've talked about it at bottom seminars before, but I was out there the other day and I knew I needed to take some new pictures and stuff. And so that's just one I wanted everybody to be able to see. Um, So we'll go talk about tarpons now. So anyway, um, I'm, for anybody who doesn't know, I'm Tim Broom with Half Inch Tackle. This is my buddy Mark Holtz. He runs 30A Guide Service, and he's been helping me out with seminars this year, and I appreciate that. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about tarpon fishing. You know, and like the sign says, normally we start to catch them in mid-May, and we'll catch them through mid-August. And... When I came here tonight, um, I was prepared to tell y'all they hadn't even caught a tarpon yet, but I heard we got new intel. Today on the way over here, a uh, buddy of mine said he caught one two days ago, and that's the first one that I've heard of being it, caught lately. And how many did you say he saw that, that same day? He said there were a lot in one school, um, but after that, he said most of them have just been little pods of a few. Right. Uh, and another guy that I talked to who does this, and to be honest, he's good. He said he ran west eastbound to all, all the way from here to Mexico Beach and saw one pod of three fish. Yeah. So for me, with people on my boat all the time, I'm not really looking hard for him yet. 
Uh, but I think any day now it's going to get fun, and that's my favorite way to fish. Yeah, and I think it's just the um, the whole tarpon thing this year um, is kind of go going to go along with everything else this spring. Everything has been late. Kobe, what Kobe has got here, we're here did come. They were late. The king mackerel were late. The amberjack were late. The wind's still blowing. The wind's still blowing. The water's still cool. I mean, this looks like, the weather outside to me looks like March weather. You know, it's gotten a little warmer, but it's still March windy outside. <coughs> and I don't know about y'all, but I'm really ready for the wind to quit because it seems like every day I've gone, I've gotten my ass just handed to me. Except I did fish last Thursday, which was really nice, but other than that, every day I've been has been, it was so rough. We were out last Tuesday. I knew it was time to come home. I was running one of the customer's boats here out of Legendary. He's got a 43 Everglade with quad 300, or yeah, quad 300s on it. And when I dumped them underneath the water three times in a row, I was like, okay, reel them up, let's go home. It was yeah, that Tim, big. Tim's not allowed to drive my boat. <laughs> we only had a foot of water That's in the deck. But it, that was the time, let's go. But anyway, so the tarpon fishing, as soon as this wind lays down, it's, we've got to have a front or something come real soon. It's going to lay all this wind down. That's when the tarpon fishing is going to get good. I think the tarpon are there now. Like Lionel, like Mark was saying, Lionel caught one the other day. We just don't have the, it has to be calm to do this. You're not going to go out there even on a two to three foot day and be able to do this. Um, it's just not that kind of fishing. Um, several keys to this tarpon thing. And I have on here a breakaway anchor system. If you don't have a trolling motor, you need a breakaway anchor system. And what that, all that is is to have a poly ball attached to your anchor. If you have your big motor running, the likelihood of you getting a tarpon bite is cut at least in half, if not more. So we need to be on trolling motor power or anchored. If we're anchored, we need to have a quick release because when you get a bite, you're going to have to go with that tarpon. You need to be able to walk up there to the bow, unclip it, just throw it over. Don't worry that the anchor's there. Have a big poly ball on it. Go fight your tarpon and come back. Get your, pot and get your anchor back. Never chase schools of tarpon. If you chase the tarpon, you're not going to get a bite. They're smarter than that. You have to let the tarpon come to you. So, we're, you know, and where the tarpon are, we're going to get to that. And we'll show you kind of the zone you need to be in, whether you're sitting there with, on your trolling motor or on your anchor. When, when you say never try chasing them, what if you're on them and you lose your opportunity? So if, you, if that happens to you, the tarpon get to you, you don't get a bite, you need to get well offshore of them. And you need to go, they're going to stay on the line that they're on, just kind of like Kobe as well. You need to go offshore of the tarpon at least a quarter to a half a mile and go a half a mile past them, reset up and wait for them to get to you again. Um, but if you go chasing them, you're not getting them. Whenever you're fighting a tarpon, these fish are big and they operate a little different than most everything that we do. We have to have somewhat of lighter tackle to be able to cast and do all the things we need to do, but we need the power to deal with that fish also. When you're pulling, when you're fighting a tarpon, the tarpon is going this way. You want, if you want him to turn and come back to you, pull away from him back towards his tail. He will turn around. But if you try to pull him or sideways or forward, he's not going to do what you want him to do. Now, I, w I was lucky that the first tarpon I ever caught was with a ridiculous tarpon guide in Puerto Rico. And I every time, and I'll be honest, even now off the beaches, hooking into a ladyfish on a little jig that you know, and on a tarpon, you can feel him get ready to jump. You kind of know it's coming, but on a ladyfish, you can't. But you do kind of see your line going one way. And for me, and I, people hate ladyfish. They don't like catching them. I love it. Because to me, it's like fighting a little tarpon. So if he starts going this way, I'm here. And if he starts going back, I'm here. Because I could just hear that guy in the back of my head going, 
turn your rod over. And like he'd grab my rod and turn it. So every one of those fish that I caught, you could, I could just feel it. So that's huge for me. And we're going to have some slides too um, about feeling the tarpon and when you bow to the tarpon. I got a whole series of slides on that too. Um, and just like I said, just like not chasing the tarpon, tarpon are smart. Present the bait that, in a way that the tarpon finds it. So, if this, if the TV is a tarpon, if you throw your bait over here and bring your bait to the tarpon, the likelihood of you getting a bite is not very good. Because no time in nature does a bait fish run at a predator fish. That just doesn't happen. Tarpon are smarter than that. If this is the tarpon, we need to put the bait back over here and bring the bait this way. So when it gets in front of the tarpon, if we make a mistake, we pull it further away from the tarpon. That's what happens in nature. A school of bait fish does not run into a school of tarpon because that's just like committing suicide. It just doesn't work. I heard a guy once, and it's a weird, dumb saying, but it's true. And he said, if you want to be a better tarper, tarpon fisherman, become a better caster. Yep. And that was like that. I and that's I guess people who get on my boat aren't used to using my tackle a lot of the times, so and aren't used to using my stuff. So sometimes they'll grab a rod, and I you can always tell if somebody's like, hey, can I throw one of these out first? So like when you do get maybe you get one chance a day, and somebody hasn't used your rod at all, they're not overhand hooking my tower somehow trying to throw something they're not used to. So you may get one shot at it. Yep. And it's a lot different throwing a 10 inch ladyfish at, a, at something than it is a cigar minnow. So I kind of got this one out of order, but we'll go ahead and do it anyway. Talking about what do you actually need for a rod and reel. We need a seven to eight foot medium to medium heavy spinning rod. We want this spool with like 30 to 40 pound braid. Then we want a 30 pound, at least a 25 to 50 foot, 30 pound shock leader. And then the leader for the tarpon is actually either 40 or 50 pound fluorocarbon. And you need to learn how to tie some specific knots. This right here is an Albright knot that connects my mono fluorocarbon leader to my shock leader. And then the shock leader is attached to the braid using an FG knot. And there are a ton of videos on the FG knot on YouTube. And I tie it in reverse. Most of the ones that you see on YouTube, the FG knot can be a little intimidating when you first try to start learning it. But if you kind of look up reverse uh, FG, well, you know, most of the time, I, is, is everybody kind of familiar with an FG, at least heard of it? How many have tried to tie one? Successfully tied one? Oh, we got a couple. So, most of them have you where you got the spool of braid is sitting over here and like a rod holder or something. And God, if I had my glasses, I could see this better. And they got you wrapping around a button on your shirt and doing all this stuff. And even for most of those videos, it takes them a while. It takes them three or four or five minutes to tie one. So and I wish I'd have brought my glasses because it is a little hard for me to see in here. But oh, let me borrow those. Yeah. So for me, I tie it backwards, and I found this one on YouTube just by mistake. But most of them start, they wrap the mono around the braid. And I know y'all can't see this, but I want you to just see how quick it is. And I can talk while I'm doing this. Um, it's 10 wraps on each side. And you want to make sure when you're tying this 
and just look up um, on YouTube reverse FG knot and you'll find several videos on how I do it. But your tag in, you need a little bit long so you can do some finish work with it. But you can see the way I tie it, I have no tension on it anywhere except for in my hand. So we do like, we tie it, then we bring both of them together. We tie one half hitch. And before we do anything else to do the knot, we need to set the knot. Once we set it, then we do one more half hitch. We can trim it. And Make then sure do... you cut the tag in and not the actual line when you do that. Oh, I've done that before. Yeah. But just like that. In less than a minute, I tied an FG knot. It's not perfect because I was talking and doing it at the same time, but you can, it's easy enough to learn if you learn to do it in reverse that you can tie this thing in just less than a minute. The, the thing about the FG knot is it, that, that shock leader is 25 to 50 feet long. It ha you have to have a knot that easily casts through the guides, and the FG is the smallest knot for that. I've actually been experimenting for the course of over a year. It's how I tie, I'm doing all my uh, top shots on my bottom fishing tackle with the FG knot, just so I tie it more and more and more and get better at it. You know, I wasn't going to tell you this because I don't like to admit it when you have a good idea. Um, when you brought me those two reels that I had, those two Saragosas, yeah. I broke that top shot off of one and it was still on the other one, that other one caught more fish. And I kept trying to wonder what was going on on that rod than the other, so you tricked me into that, and I'll give credit where credit's due. <laughs> so see, I do do something right once in a while. So tarpons, the next little series here is just a bunch of little pictures. Uh, well, it was a bunch of pictures. I do want to say, I do mine a little differently. Okay. I use a longer rod tarpon fishing than I do for my other fishing because I'll use a longer leader. I don't use, I, well, I just said that I was tricked into it, so now I'm gonna have to reevaluate this. But normally I wouldn't use that wind on, and I would uh, just use a much longer leader. So I normally use, bring out two of my bigger rods when I do go look for tarpon, so that I, just for that reason, to use a longer leader, not have to cast that knot through the guys. Yeah. So, you know, um, just some, Randomness, you know. So, this picture right here, you see this all the time. Do not take this picture and post this on Facebook. Hey, maybe it was. Do, does anybody know why you should not post this picture? There you go. In in the U.S. Yes. But that, I have that one there for a reason. That's, Ill that's actually illegal to do here. I hope you don't have that picture I sent you. <laughs> um, this is one that we're going to talk about a little bit later. But this, at this point right here, if you're not bowing to the tarpon and giving him line, this is the point where you lose the tarpon every single time. Um, you know, always get him up beside the boat, get a little picture, let him go. You know, make sure you don't bring him out of the water. Um, you know, very similar to cobia fishing, the tarpon are going to be right on this little, just where the, where the bar is and then out to where the water color change is. They're, not gonna, they're normally not going to be right on the bar. From the bar where it first starts to get deep to where the color change is, that's where you're going to want to be positioned with your trolling motor and or your anchor. And the tarpon, in the beginning, they're going to come down the beach and normally in pretty good sized schools. They're going to be in 20 to 50s. I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a minute. But they're going to be coming along, gulping air. They're, if the conditions are right, if we have that, 
you know, that nice little north, northeast wind, the beach is slick, calm. You're going to be able to see, and it's not like cobia fishing where, oh, there he is. You're going to see them a quarter mile away. You know, they're, they're easy to spot. You know, this is actually a cobia fishing picture, but I wanted to give you, like, the bar is right, the bar ends right here, and you notice this boat's in the deeper water right off the bar. That's where the tarpon are going to be, just like when we're cobia fishing. Um, so these, this set of tarpon is, you can see right here, this is the color change off the bar. They're actually on the sandbar. We don't find them that way a lot, but that school, and these are all pictures from here in Dustin, of course, you can tell by the water. Um, this school has actually pushed all the way up inside the bar in the trough. They're right up on the beach. And sitting there circling. Sometimes you'll find, sometimes you'll be running down the beach and you'll find them just sitting there milling around. They're just sitting there going around in a circle. The ones that are doing that, those are real hard to catch. And see, this boat is positioned to where they can put a bait out here and bring it this way with the tarpon going that way. So the bait's going to come away from the tarpon. That's, that's boat positioning right there. And notice that they're keep, you know, the sandbar's here, so the beach is over here, so they got the tarpon on the correct side of the boat. You know... This is one of the guys who caught one off his paddleboard here a couple years ago. Can, can I tell a paddleboard story that's yes, you still bothering me? I took my paddleboard out on Sunday of last week. That day, if any of you guys saw the beach, it was just absolutely flat, calm, beautiful. And I took my paddleboard down. I was like, I'm just going to go paddle around for a few minutes and see what happens. But me being me, I couldn't go out without taking a fishing rod. Uh, and I live in Grayton, and there were I don't know how many hundreds of people on the beach out there so I'm out there with my little jig just one jig and a 20 pound or a small reel a 3,000 spooled with 20 pound braid and a little 30 pound leader on it and I hooked a Spanish and uh, my friends later on asked me what I was doing because I was just trying to stun that fish to get him under the bungee cords on the front of the boat and get my hook out somehow but I ended up with three Spanish underneath the bungees on the front of my paddle board and at the same time, I want to say five, six hundred jacks swam under my paddleboard. Like those, I mean, you know the size of the jacks that we have. They're anywhere from 20 to 40 pound jacks. They're huge. And I'm like, uh-oh, and just pitched one out and hooked it. And when I set the hook on that fish, I want to say every single one of those fish boiled. And just in every direction all around me. And I was just standing up there hoping anybody saw what was happening. That fish started running and running and running. So I tightened my drag and my board turned fast. And I just started going through the water. Maybe, I don't it felt like I was going 30 miles an hour through the water. But I was just leaning back, holding on. Um, luckily, I lost that fish about a mile and a half down the beach from where I started. But I don't know what I would have done. Had it. Yeah, so that... That is hitting me in the fields today, looking at that picture. I can't imagine catching a tarpon on a paddle board. I mean, that, that would be an experience. You know, you don't even need a paddle board. Just a big old unicorn works. You know, of course, tarp, these guys, now see, these guys are close to being legal. They caught it in a, in a kayak, but they, they've got most, they got part of the tarpon in the water. They would probably get away with doing that. Uh, recognize that one, Mark? You know, the trolling motor, that is just an essential part of this. If you don't have it, you're going to have to have a breakaway anchor. Uh, the tarpon rod we talked about. You know, as far as right reels, you know, yes, sir. The trolling motor is so quiet, it does not seem to bother them. Um, but your other rod, your other motor is make, even the new four strokes make more noise underwater. You know, have it run in one day, be very careful, just hop off and listen to what it sounds like under the water. Um, you can definitely hear it. Um, let's see here. You know, so we talked about, you know, seven to eight foot rods, a medium, medium heavy spinning reel, um, my preferred reel, 
is the Shimano Saragosas. I think that's what you snapper and grouper fish mostly inshore with. Yep. Um, so it's a, it's a reel that's heavy duty enough to catch tarpons on. Like I say, Mark uses them for his inshore snapper and grouper fishing. Um, Just to be clear, our inshore snapper and grouper fishing, they're not little fish. There's some... Oh, there's... Yeah, that, that reel's about all you need. Because y'all have, have already caught a snapper that was at least 15 pounds this year and a couple 15, 12, 15, and 18 groupers pound groupers. Too. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, a step up from the Saragossa is the Shimano Twin Power. And then above that is a Stella, but I think the Stella is way overkill. Um, as far as braid, you definitely want Power Pro braid, Yozuri Floor Carbon for your leader material. Your shock leader can be just regular mono. It doesn't have to be fluorocarbon, just that last three or four feet. Um, the hooks I use is the same hook that I use for all of my snapper fishing. Uh, it's an owner Mutu Light 7 knot. It's the exact same hook that I use for snapper fishing. And it's a hook that I'll even use for grouper fishing if I'm in less than you know, 150 feet of water or so. But the same exact hook, same exact size. So you don't even have to, most of y'all probably don't even have to buy a different hook. Um, you know, Sabiki rigs, um, we talk a lot about this at a lot of the seminars. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. If you're out there by the pass catching bait and you notice that you're not catching them very well and somebody else is or vice versa, it's probably because they have these cheapo bait rigs. These are like $1.49. This one's like $3.49. This has real fish skin. This has fake fish skin. Buy a quality bait rig. Bait catching will go much faster. Also, buy a lot of them because when you hook one blue runner or a Spanish or something that twists up, I would much rather just cut that thing off and forget about it, then try to untangle it and waste another couple minutes. So the best thing, another, see, now I'm giving you credit for two things. You showed up with about 50 Sabiki rigs on the boat the other day. That was probably the, my favorite time that you've ever shown up to get on my boat. Um, you know, and we, we sell bait rigs. If you buy them, by, if you buy, we have a price. If you buy one, if you buy 24 of a size, you get an extra 10% discount on buying 24 of a size. Um, on bait rigs also. Like I felt bad about it at first, just kind of cutting it off and being like, man, I spent money on that, you know? But then it's like, is it, is 15, 10 minutes of my time worth $3? I mean, over over the course of you know, 300 and, days, maybe, but no. And of course you can always buy bait from the bait boat too, but the bait boat typically has m most, you're gonna get mostly cigar minnows from the bait boat which is fine if you're going bottom fishing. You know, the slides here on bait, I have them organized um, by species, of which I think is the best. You know, for tarpon, it's herring. A live herring is number one. And most of the time, the herring are where you don't want to catch them. You know, we can catch cigar minnows outside the pass. Most mornings, the herring are right between the rocks where all the worst wake is, the charter boats are all sitting in there catching bait, and you need to sit. But if you're going to be real good at this tarpon fishing thing, you need to sit in there with all that garbage going on and make sure you catch live herring. Next is an LY. We catch them in the same place. You're not out, you're out of order. Threadfin herring should be before... Threadfin herring should be right here. The threadfin herring, most of the time, I find them best up around the Destin Bridge or back around um, Destin Marina. You'll, you'll be able to catch them better back there. Those My, threadfins are everywhere right now. Yeah. I think that's where me and you were the other day. Um, and then fourth on my list, you know, cigar minnow. Hardtails are good bait. Then a finger mullet. The threadfin herring that was out of place. You can cast net menhaden in the bay. Uh, they don't live that great. Um, if you've got a big enough live well, menhaden are actually really good baits. They probably would, would make my top five if I could keep them alive better. It takes a heck of a live well. They won't live in the, the, the boats that have kind of like the little almost rectangular live wells. 
they will not live in there at all. It has to be circular. Um, so we talked about boat positioning, what to do, how to find the tarpon along the beaches, and now it's doing battle with the tarpon. What do you do once you get a bite? So you were talking about this in Puerto Rico. Tell them your story, how you felt the ladyfish. So it, you can't, I mean, you guys have hooked a ladyfish before. Like, you know it's going to jump, but you can't feel it. There's a, and after you hook one tarpon, and honestly, like, fighting a tarpon for an hour, if you're on a light enough rod, is fun. But just getting him to jump is my favorite part. And once you feel him jump once or twice, you kind of feel it. It kind of, I don't even really know how to describe it. It's, it you're sitting there, and the, the fish is pulling, and you it's just they're, they're run, drag, run, drag, pull, pull. And you, there's this just steady pressure, and he's getting ready. And that steady pressure, he's going down, and when he starts to go down, he's, he's going to try to jump and shake that hook. If you're not ready for that, that's, I mean, that's, this is when you're going to lose him it, if you're not ready. It's almost like a pause for a second, and yeah. you're like, uh-oh, here, here it comes. And you can just feel, and you just feel the line starting to rise a little bit, and about that time he's out of the water. But we call it bowing to the tarpon. If, the, if you if you have constant pressure on him and he jumps, two things are going to happen: you're going to pull the hook, or he's going to break off. Because he's going to do that. And when he's in midair, if you're not giving him some, if you you don't you don't want those slack in the line, but you need to be taking some pressure off. When he does that, because when he does that, he's either pulled the hook or broke off if you didn't do something. This one's just, this is one that was perfect. He's just coming up out of the water. You just got, right that time, you got to be giving it to him. Like I say, this is the point where the tarp, if you haven't bowed to the tarpon, he's gone. Say bye-bye to that one. We're going to look for some more. You know, the first time I ever caught a tarpon, I went on a charter with a guy, and I thought for sure, I mean, paying for a charter, like, you're going to catch you're gonna catch as many as you want. But, I mean, you guys are here. You know what fishing's like. I, even now, I feel like sometimes I could go out all day and maybe never see one, but luckily know enough backup plans to go catch some fish. But the first time I went out for maybe seven or eight hours and never saw a fish, and we caught, I caught one mutton snapper that was like this big and had it in the cooler i was whatever it's that's fishing get back to the dock and the, the captain pulls out a knife out of his pocket and he was like give me that snapper and cut a fillet on like in one stroke i'll never forget it and he was like give me your rod and pitch the or put the hook right through that fillet and that tarpon was underneath the dock that we had left from and i, I just i'll never forget he was like pitch it out in front of it so I opened the bale and I just pitched that fillet out. He did a little circle, opened his mouth and grabbed it. And the cat, the guide looks at me and he goes, get on the boat. And I was like, and that thing took me like two and a half miles offshore. I fought it for about 45 minutes and brought it to the boat. And then we get back to the dock and I'll, uh, there's a second one sitting underneath it. He goes, you want to do it again? And I was like, yeah, I want to do it again. And I have pictures of it, but they're awful because I was so tired after the second one, I couldn't hold it up. So I was kind of like, in the water with my arms all lazy so mark i'll show you but don't make fun of me so we have our tarpon fishery there's days that you're going to go you're going to go out there and you're going to see two or three fish there's days that you're going to go out there and you're going to see two or three hundred or two or three thousand we have a great tarpon fishery but you're talking about so you got to talking about the keys and it just reminded me of something if any of y'all ever go to the keys and you have not, and you have been down there, or you haven't, and you're gonna go, and you haven't been to Robbie's, you need to go do this. They have, we got in so much trouble down there one day. Come on. And I, I think too, no one here really spends enough time looking for tarpon. I think everybody's excited now, especially about snapper opening up. Sometimes it's, I mean, sorry. Yeah. 
this place in Isla Mirada is called Robbie's. They've hand fed these tarpon. They got them like pets. And these things, you can see these, this fish right here is well over 200. That one's probably 85 or so. There's a little one there. There's another great big one there. There are just literally hundreds, if not thousands of tarpon underneath Robbie's dock. And it's touristy. It's ter I mean, it's terrible. I mean, you get there and they charge you like, I think it's $10 for a bucket with a dozen herring in it. And you, you can hand feed them off the dock. I mean, they'll literally come and take it from your hand. Um, you can take one, you get one of your buddies that maybe you need to get even with him for something. Get him to lay on the dock and put his arm down and do this with the, with the herring. I've seen some of my buddies that I did, did this to. Those tarpon are so aggressive, and it's not the ones that you see out there in the water. It's the ones that come from underneath the dock and eat it. They'll grab the daggum herring, and they're going to have you up to here, and your arm's in his mouth. They're trying to pull you over, and when he comes out, he won't really hurt you, but, boy, it's just like sandpaper going down your arm. It's terrible. But it is really funny, and the pelicans there, you got to watch out for them because they'll come and steal your herring and they'll bite. The pelicans are worse than tarpon. But Robbie's is a cool place. If you've never gone down there, if, you, if you've never been to the Keys, seen Robbie's, you need to go do that. Um, um, lures for tarpon. So realistically, our tarpon fishery is primarily a live bait fishery for boat fishing. Um, the pier guys, to kind of tell you how good the tarpon fishery is here, our pier has a tarpon tournament every year. And there's one particular guy who's real good at it from the pier. His name's Jason Zabelski. He's won it the last three or four or five years. He's won the tarpon tournament. And he's caught over 50 each year off the pier. And to be an official tarpon catch at the pier, you have to hook the tarpon, you get him up between the two pilings, and you got to take a picture, time stamp with date and time. And that's, that's your official entry. And then they break the fish off. They catch, a, they catch a bunch of them from the pier on lures. I have been very unsuccessful doing it from a boat. Almost 95% of mine from the boat have all been on live baits. Different? I prefer lure fishing, so I think this time next year i'll be curious to see how you feel about that comment hey i'm up for it <laughs> but as far as lures that work i mean the rapala um x wraps th this is a great lure well you switched um, to being a big fan of vertical jigging lately too so yeah um vert i love vertical jigging the yozuri twitch bait lures they used to make only two little trout sizes they make a a four inch and a five inch in this one. It's a great lure for tarpon off the pier. Um, it actually is a good one for blackfin tuna. There's a lot of other things we do. Um, huh. I don't have a picture of it. The little hoagie baits. Yeah. This is the number one tarpon lure from the pier for several reasons. It, it's the best lure. We'll pass, we'll pass these around for y'all. It works really good. The tarpon really love these. They're not as expensive. Unfortunately, if you're in the boat, most of the time you're going to get the lure back. But the guys at the pier, that Yozuri lure is about $14. And that Rapala lure is about $12. You lose that on every fish because you have to break them. You can't bring them up on the pier, so you've got to break them off once you get your picture. So you're losing the lure. These are only like $4. But y'all can pass those around. That's, those are the number one lures on the pier. Those old green tsunami swim sheds, too, are pretty good. No, we're actually seeing the, the tarpon are going to come by the pier, and they're rolling just like they would be from the boat. And we're going to pitch it out way past the tarpons and bring it back across where they're coming. And it's a free-for-all on the pier. It is literally a free-for-all. Let me ask you this. By tarpon swimming habits, is there a type of swimming pattern you like the best like do you like the gulping fish do you like the deep fish the gulping fish bite better than the deep swimming fish for certain and we really you know the little l wise for bait we 
the cigar is we catch a lot, we don't catch many LYs when we're fishing out in front of the pass. If you go down to fish on some of the snorkel reefs, you'll catch a lot more LYs. You know the tarpon are about to really, the, when they're really going to kick on at the pier, is you'll walk out there in the morning and there's just, as far as you can see, there's dead LYs floating on top of the water. And the tarpon are going to be going down the beach, gulping air, and they just loop, 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 loop. And those LYs, they spawn, and when they, when they, as soon as they spawn, they die. And when they start dying and they're all floating on top of the water, that's when the tarpon bite's going to, it's about to be on. Um, uh, let's see. Those are the days. I don't even know how many tarpon are in this video, but there's got to be three, four, five hundred. Uh, this is about two years old. See them, uh, see them gulping along. You know, everybody talks about going down to Boca Grande Pass and tarpon fishing, yeah. jet ski. <laughs> Has no, he probably has no clue the tarpon are even there. Last, last year, it's either last year or the year before, I saw a school like that go on the surface gulping south of the sea buoy. We didn't know what it was. I had to go over and look at it, and we were like, oh, just wasn't, wasn't ready for that at all. But those gulping tarpon, like I say, those are easy to catch. The ones that are doing that just middle in a circle, those are tough. They're not quite in the mode. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing when they're doing that. Oh, your cobias. Oh, those are red snappers. Might be the only tarpon ones I got. Oh, is this the cool one? This is the Mako eating a tarpon. Uh -huh. He was, this, this, somebody shot this. I actually got this one off of Facebook. Somebody shot this on the beach. He's sitting there chasing down a tarpon. Got him. Got him. Um, well, you know, a lot of the seminars we do are fairly in-depth. There's a lot to talk about. You know, tarpon fishing is fairly simple. Um, questions? I mean, I don't see any. Uh, here, it's a big thing, and that's one thing that I really want to focus on a lot more. Uh, lately the fish here are shallow I mean it's not a thing even with a floating line and whatever leader you have on there it's still gonna be there the one thing that I think a lot of people do here is spook that fish so the guy who really got me squared away with my fly fishing um, had me basically no false cast launch that get that thing out there and you're probably gonna spook him and he's gonna go under the boat because their instinct is to go offshore. But he, his big thing is on that second cast backwards. He said he hooks almost every fish he hooks on the offshore side of the boat. So you get, you get, you get your shot going forward. And then when he gets close, he's on, he's on the other side of that boat. And he said almost every hook up there. And he's the guy I was talking to that ran all the way to Mexico beach a few days ago. He's probably the best tarpon guy that I've ever met. Um, yeah, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> if you think it's hard catching them on spinning gear, it's hard, it's hard to catch them on fly gear for sure. I think there's just, there's a lot more, um, I mean, I 
from my experience fly fishing, there's a lot more stretch. And there's a lot more, the rod's not as stiff. You have a lot more give in it. You know, like a lot of guys put way too much hammer on it on a, on a spinning rod. And I, I don't know, I think. If, before, if they're already at the boat and you missed your shot, it won't hurt to try it there before you get going. Because yeah. Yeah. sometimes once, they're, once they know you're there, because I feel like the tarpon here aren't little. They're big fish. Like the average fish here is a lot bigger than the ones in other places. Our fish, I think, I think our fish probably have 80 pound average at least. And our fish are big. They're not dumb so i think most of the time they probably know your boat's there before you see them and they're i i think it's worth that second shot before you go cut them off again because a lot of times too if i get up and go cut them off i may not find them again i mean i'll get down of them and maybe they're still offshore maybe i <laughs> spooked them too much throwing too many things at them but and just with like with and there's when we're talking about fishing like his, his is a little different than mine. There is no, there's never a single right or wrong way. And we, sh and all of us are always still in the learning phase. You know, Mark said something a minute ago. I've kind of gotten into slow pitch jigging the last year or so. Well, slow pitch jigging is very new. If you walk in, and I, customers come in the store all the time and ask me questions about it, I'm like, I'm not an expert at this because I'm still learning. If anyone tells you they're an expert at slow pitch jigging, they're lying. It hasn't been, it's only been around for 18 months. That's not long enough for anybody to be an expert at it. There's never a right way and a wrong way. It's like, you know, because if you come in and ask me, what's the number one color of lure? If we're going to go marlin fishing, trout fishing, doesn't matter, pink's number one. Well, the first thing I did when I went slow pitch jigging is I bought a bunch of pink jigs. Eh, it worked, but it wasn't great. It's chartreuse and glow and white with the little ugly silver stripes on them. That's what works. If it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. Um, so we're all still learning that. And the same thing, when I was a kid, something has changed. Um, I, grew, I grew up fishing here my whole life. And when I was a kid back in the 70s, we would catch maybe one tuna every other year, and then one year we'd catch four or five tunas from the pier, black fin tunas, that is. And then in 1985, we had, um, I think it was Hurricane Elena. And after Hurricane Elena, we would catch every year off the pier, we would catch, I, I've had, I can't tell you how many days I've had where I caught three tunas in a day from the pier. We'd catch two or three, some days we'd catch two or three hundred tunas at the pier. And then in 1995, we had Hurricane Opal. And before Elena, there were no tarp or no tunas at the pier. And after Opal, it's kind of gone back to the old times where they catch some, but it's never great. When I was a kid at the pier, we saw a lot of tarpon, but we caught very few, hooked very few. And then all of a sudden, about 10 years ago, the tarpon up here decided to bite. And now they literally catch thousands every year off the pier. Like I say, the guy who wins the tarpon tournament every year catches, a, he averages about 50 catches a year off the pier. Is this going to last for another 20 years? We don't know. But I can tell you that if you went back 10 years ago and you went back and looked at the records from the pier books, because they give a pass away for the first tarpon caught every year. Well, if you went back what's it, to 2011 and went all the way back to 1974 when the pier opened, that's 35, 40 years, I bet you out of half of those years, they never gave away the free pass for a tarpon. They didn't catch a single one. 
So the tarpon fishing is great, but it hasn't always been that way, and we don't know if it'll stay that way. So we're still, like I say, so we've been catching them for 10 years. I don't think any of us is an expert at it even 10 years later. Um, and I, I think a, a reason why is because other places, tarpon are there in weird times of the year. But for here, tarpon kind of coincides with red snapper. So now, and I, I don't have anything against red snapper, uh, but everybody's so focused on snapper that everybody wants to go out of the pass and head south instead of running the beaches. So just nobody wants to spend the time, come home disappointed, learning that and focusing on it. And especially as a charter captain, everybody's expecting to catch fish and wants meat in the cooler and kind of forget sometimes that fishing is fun. And sometimes to me, hooking a tarpon and just getting him to jump once and losing him is, is I'd, I'll remember that at the end of the day more than, than a, another snapper. And I think one of the, if, if somebody asked me, he said, what's the number one reason the tarpon are here? And it's because if I'd say one number one reason is water conditions in South Florida. There's so much runoff out of Okeechobee on both sides. And they've had, we've had, a little, you know, every five or 10 years, we'll get a little bit of red tide. They've had it every year for 10 or 15 years now. They got that green algae slime, not, not June grass, but just green algae slime that has just literally killed every bit of grass and weed and everything else and their estuary systems down there from the sugar plantation runoffs. Um, and I think it's water quality has pushed more and more tarpon up here. And because there's more and more fish, there's a battle for, for food. And that's what's made them bite better. But that's just speculation. I can't prove it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nope, not a thing. No, we don't need to bring that up. Not a thing. <laughs> no, it, it. There's there's a but in December, January, and February, there are a bunch of them. You heard right. The pump no, station. You can go back there by the pump station in the winter time. There's all you want this size. Anywhere from five to twenty pounders. All you want. I don't think so. I think uh, some of the, the, It's been a long time since we've had a cold that would. Yeah, the water temperature stayed a lot colder a lot later in the year, but still overall, I mean, it, I don't think it got bad at all. Yeah, we never got out of the I, 50s. The ones in the fall, don't, they don't seem to be feeding when they come back. They come back, that we do get a migration through, but the, the ones that, like the pier, where they catch a bunch of them this time of year, they catch almost zero when they come back by in the fall. And it, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, they're residential fish. I, I think they're residential, but you'll see them, like especially last year during COVID, I ran the beaches almost nonstop. I mean, there was nobody on, you weren't allowed to be on the beaches and no tourists were here. And I didn't know what to do with my time if I didn't have a trip. So I was running the beaches looking for cobia. And I saw more tarpon first week of March, April into May. And I couldn't, I would try and throw everything I could at them. And eventually I got to a point where I was like, I'm not even gonna, Look at, oh, these are here. I'll try again when the water gets warmer. They, 
you'd be surprised. They were moving all over the place. I mean, it wasn't a. I didn't notice a specific direction they were heading. And yeah. And they 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 normally don't start to bite till the LYs start to die. There's some correlation there. And it's I'm I'm with you. I mean I my degrees in engineering, so I pattern as much as I can and except for fish. There's these things make no sense. Yeah. There's no sense to it. So don't the, I think the best thing too, and this is totally off topic, is having a good network of people to to work with. Like I could never be the fisherman that I am if it wasn't for certain people, like even Mark here just certain people kind of telling you like, hey, this worked today, this didn't. And sometimes, I mean, when I, when I first got here, I tried to do it all myself and it worked ish, but having the right network of people to talk to, like for, I mean, I'm sure you've said, you've spent so much time looking for them. I'm sure I could pick up something from talking to you as much as if, if there was anything that you learned from us, you know, it's just having the right group of people talking to each other. And that's really hard to find with some of the guys. And you, and you can't be afraid to try something different, new. Um, try something out of the norm. Um, it depends on what I'm doing. Right now, I'm really, I have sinking line on because I'm king mackerel fishing. Um, so I'm, which is wild if you, we can talk about that afterwards, but for mine, I probably w wouldn't throw sinking line at them with the right. So, I mean, it's an intermediate sinking tip anyway. Yeah. So what else we want to know? So is everybody catching plenty of snappers and groupers? It's been good so far. Can I say something about yep. snappers? Please just keep what you guys are going to eat, because I'll see guys going out. And I have, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, everyone's going to do whatever they want. But I'll see guys stuff their boat with 20 kids and go out and catch 40 snapper on Saturday and then 40 more on Sunday just to put pictures on the Internet. And then even, and, I, and I, I'm venting now, but I have guys who, who will charter a boat on Friday that are leaving Saturday, and we'll get back to the ramp, and they're like, oh, no, I, we don't need this. We're flying home tomorrow. And they're like, so I'm very cognizant now of talking after f f four or five years of that surprise um, at having that talk with people. But I, I just see so many pictures, especially the last week, of people I'll, killing fish. I put the same post on Facebook the other night. You know, I don't know how most everybody else feels on snappers. I really wish the limit was one, and we had four months to catch them rather than two and two months. Because I hate the derby. This whole, this, you know, everybody's going to go snapper fishing. Well, this whole derby thing makes you have to fish days that you wouldn't normally fish because there's only, there's only what, 44 days of snapper season. So, it, you know, most of us all work. So that gives us two days a week. Well, there's eight weeks of snapper season. I'm going to get 16 days. So we're going on those 16 days. I don't care. I mean, like I say, I, I fished last Tuesday, Thursday, yesterday, and today. And I promise you, last Tuesday, yesterday, and today were sporty. You better be salty if you were out there because it, it, was, it was special. Um, but, yeah, I, I totally agree, you know. I would much rather see the limit go down to one and us have twice the number of days. Because um, there's so much else to catch right now. You know, like, just for instance, last Thursday we had, of course, I was running a guide trip, so I had my limit of snappers, which was only eight. wasn't too bad. I only had four guys. We had our eight snappers. No, no, no. That was yesterday. Yesterday we had our eight snappers. We had a gag. We had a red grouper and two black fin tunas. Pretty good box of fish. Um, there's so much other things to catch right now because we've got the dolphins are here now, the king mackerels are here, there's plenty of wahoos. You know, you should be able to go out and make a pretty nice box of fish and not have to have 
20 of any one species. A lot of scamps right now. So fishing's fishing's great if y'all if you haven't been lately. Yeah. I would too, if I, especially if I'm gonna eat them. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say. I've never been able to go out and target what I call, I like flipper mahis, where they're like like those eight to twelve pounders. Those are very rare. I mean, you'll catch one inside of twenty miles, but you won't catch five. You're going, to, you know, inside of 20 miles. If you can get a good grade of 16 inches, I think that's pretty good. Now the fads right now, there's all the daggum eight to 12 pounders you want to catch, and they gotta have. <coughs> they're gonna have to fix some stuff that's going on out there because I don't know how who's gonna regulate it, how they're gonna do it, but you know. Those fads were put there for recreational and charter fishermen. And I know there's been two commercial boats out there lately. And they got these two long arm thingies. And they pull up to the fad and it goes boop, and it puts about 30 baits in the water. And it goes boop, and it pulls up like 20 mahi on each one. And they dehook all them and they go back boop, do it again and again and again. That's not right. I have nothing, and I have nothing against commercial fishing because. Everybody's going to want to turn around and walk out of here tonight and go to Lulu's and eat fish, and that's all commercially caught fish, so we have to have commercial fishing, but we also have to have reasonable limits on both sides of the fence. And fishing those fads for commercially caught dolphin I don't think is the right thing to do. I bitched at our mayor. I told our mayor about it and bitched to him the other day. So yeah, He's on the Gulf Council, so maybe he'll get something done. Yeah. So I fish the bay a lot, and there's there's definitely big tarpon back here. I think they're pretty hard to target back there. I I, I agree. Last year, to fall time frame, um, when those big schools of bull reds and jacks and things are moving around in the bay, and I live I launch from three thirty one. So every day that I fish, I run the whole bay around, go offshore, come back, and run the whole way back. So I, if I see something in the bay, I mean, I cover enough bay. Like, if I, I should see it. I should notice it. Um, last year, I noticed a bunch of tarpon. But our tarpon fishery here, at least from what I've patterned, is a sight fishing thing off the beach. And you can't see anything in our bay. So I'll be honest, when I saw them last year, and I thought they were sturgeon jumping, because I wasn't expecting to see as many as I did between 331 and Hogtown, uh, but they were. And the more I sat there and watched, you'd see another one jump. And I mean, I even wanted to put trolling lines in the water and troll around and see what I could come up with. But it, the water's, in, in my opinion, you might know something different, it's, it's, it's dark. Yeah. It's hard on, our, on my side. You know, we and we have a our charter fishing fleet is as good as any charter fleet in the world. We have the largest charter fleet in the world, and they are killers. And they, if there's a fishery that they can go and use to run charters and make money, they will. And I think we have an excellent class of bay fishing charters in this area, and none of them have been able to master tarpon fishing in the bay. Um, and with their expert level of expertise, there's something that we either those fish that live in the that go in the bay don't bite. And if I had to if I had to say there's a reason for it, I don't think the tarpon really live in the bay. I think that they're going in the bay to spawn. And if most fish, when they're in a spawn mode, are not in a feeding mode. I mean, um, we, we've had them come up as close as Tim is. And just gulp air right next to the boat and i mean as a fisherman i've i've got everything rigged up i've thrown everything in the water in every direction shut my motor off drifted baits by thrown lures in every direction and i've never been able to to hook one but you might be the guy that goes and figures it out and teaches all something else if you do let us know
I don't. I think they come in the bay and spawn, and I think they leave. They're, and then the ones that, that they do spawn, we catch in the winter time, and we catch them primarily in the harbor. And these, the tarpon that I've seen in, in on my side of the bay, they're huge. Like they're not little residential, or they're not little uh, ones like you see in the harbor. They're the fully grown beach ones. So I, they, they're swimming through for some reason. Uh, but I mean, the bay it gets a lot colder in the winter and stuff. So it's, it's. I, I just I remember seeing them when it was hot outside, in the bay. So I want to say late September, October, and I can look at my notes and I. I write everything down when I'm done and kind of go back and look at it. What was I doing this time three years ago? Getting sad about missing some kind of fish somewhere. I don't think your memories are there since they changed the bass. I've seen a lot of fish in the bay. And when they bend rocks down a few years ago, that stopped. I'd love I'd love a picture with a brown water tarpon somewhere. You gotta get lucky to find it. Yeah. And if you can find especially too in, in and I think our bay is tough to fish, um, but fall is a lot better. Uh, there's big schools of fish around and normally in the fall I'll I'll go looking for them. And like I said, I cover so much water every day anyway. Um, I think that uh when I'm looking for them in the fall is when I really see them. And I don't know if that's because I'm spending more time driving around looking for, I mean, because I sometimes, I mean, if I can find a big school of bull reds or jacks or something like that, I'll wear, I'll wear those out. I mean, that's as fun as it gets. Well, a couple of years ago, I'm sorry, Randy, when, when Bogdan was there, mm -hmm. the bulls yeah. were in there probably for two weeks straight. I mean, it was very Pass those down. And that's, I think, oh. I don't know what time of year you said that was. Uh, it, yeah, it, and it slowly moves over farther east and then kind of works its way back. This year I noticed the big schools of bulls didn't really make it past Mid Bay Bridge, which I didn't like because I have to drive twice as far. Um, but I did notice tarpon on, at the mouths of the bayou, just like you said especially Aliqua, LaGrange, places like that where I like to go look for certain things. Uh, Here, there's a good job for you. You can figure out how to give those away. All right, uh, uh, I've got one. Uh, Tim mentioned two knots and tying on his stuff. Does anybody know one of them? What was that? F, F, you got it. What was a, yeah, there you go. Uh, if I wasn't throwing live bait, what color lure would I use? You just you just remember my saying. <laughs> and it's funny. I grew up fishing the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, and everybody always said, if it ain't chartreuse, it ain't no use. And I mean, even my cup is chartreuse. And I have something chartreuse everywhere on my boat. What else? Favorite live bait? Favorite, uh... Yeah, fav number one live bait that he said, and then or what live bait was also up in the top that wasn't <laughs> that that wasn't uh, that was out of place. The thread fin herring. You guys are making this easy on me. I don't have to walk very far. Um, so see how far. See how these people all got. See how far you can throw them. I'm not. I'm not even going to worry about that. What? There you go. Oh. So um, anyway, uh, next month seminar uh, will be the first Tuesday in July, which I think is about the 6th. We'll be doing offshore fishing. So expect a much longer thing. There's a lot to cover in that one. Um, if anybody's got any questions about anything, we'll be glad to answer them tonight. But I don't know much else to tell you about tarpon right now. I think, though, don't, I mean, I do this every day, and, well, every day that I can if the wind isn't blowing like it is right now. 
but it's a thing. Like a lot of guys go out, especially after thinking about it, studying it, thinking, like going through everything, tying all your knots. There are definitely days where you're going to go out and you're not going to see a fish. If, I mean, for me, yeah, exactly. And if guys want to go cobia fishing on my boat, we're going to go. But just be prepared, know what you're getting into. But as fishermen, like, you understand that. Um, it's tough, but we have backup plans, obviously, to kick offshore and grab the red snappers. Um, but just kind of know that. I mean, fishing's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be, I don't want to say frustrating, but you learn something different every time you go out there. So as long as you kind of head into it with that expectation, you're going to have a good day. But if you go out there expecting to pull a tarp into the boat every day, it's yeah, yeah. If you're if you're fishing with me, have no expectations, and we'll have a great day. <laughs> I'm kidding. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I a hundred percent. That's something we didn't talk about at all. But like, if you if there's a guy working us waiting there has an anchor ball down and he's been fishing stuff. Don't be that guy in the jet ski. Blast really? Speed right through. <coughs> and I'm turning this off. <laughs>